Where's Thu Halmin Freon and welcome to it, another video. The destruction and desecration of European history continues. And you know what's the most striking thing about it, the funniest thing, is that they always say, but it has always been like that, or we are not the first people who are doing this. Take uh, the Vikings by Netflix as an example, when it transferred from the History Channel to Netflix, and it was called Vikings Valhalla, and they made Jarl Hokun to look, well, like a Viking chieftain from around the 10th century AD, most certainly didn't look. Now, uh, I don't know what these people think, but uh, I went to university, I've got two degrees, I studied uh, old English literature and I took of course history courses and other literature courses and I never really encountered uh, mentions like these in old books and texts uh, that I read and studied but suddenly suddenly everybody's um, non-binary everybody's uh, bisexual in history uh, apparently according some uh, to some people African looking uh, Vikings existed and they lived among the uh, <laughs> the Norse Vikings from the very beginning, and they were also chieftains there. I don't know, you know, I I have never heard of it before 2022. I mean, uh, not 2022, but it's a matter of the last couple of years. The, the last 10 years really can be called uh, Orwellian years, because... Uh, this this huge focus on the destruction of the European history and myths and legends has been uh, well extreme. Now this is the latest example. Let us look at the article from Bounding into Comics. Thank you once again for bringing this to our attention. Joan of Arc to be portrayed as non-binary and questioning the gender binary in new play I Joan. <laughs> In continuing march of modern-day critical gender theory has claimed yet another victim, this time as a new play from Shakespeare's London Globe Theatre is said to portray historical French icon Saint Joan of Arc as a non-binary individual who finds his strength by questioning the gender binary. Now, if you look at what company does that, it's Shakespeare's London Globe Theatre the most renowned theatre group in the entire world. Now, when you can't trust a group like this to make uh, a decent play without cramming socio-political agenda of today's society into it, can you really trust any mainstream? No, no, you can't trust mainstream entertainment. You can't trust mainstream theater gr groups. can't trust ma uh, <coughs> mainstream publishing houses or filmmaking companies. So this is a depiction of Joan of Arc, an oil painting from 1865. As when, you know, thinking about all the genres, it really does look suspiciously a lot like the character of Galadriel from the, the upcoming Amazon's The Rings of Power. The armor and stuff. Hmm, interesting. Written by a British playwright and actor Charlie Josephine. Why am I not surprised? Whose bio notes <laughs> that they are particularly passionate about stories that center working class women and queer people and helmed by Eileen Cara Julian, co-editor Henry VI, Globe Theatre, I, Joan, is described by its creators as a powerful and joyous new play which tells Joan of Arc's story anew. The men are all fighting again, begins an official synopsis of the play, an endless war from nowhere, an unexpected leader emerges, young, Poor and about to spark a revolution. This is Joanne, rebelling against the world expectations, questioning the gender binary. Joanne finds their power and their belief spreads like fire, it continues, before inviting audiences to join us in the wooden O and feel the heat of the sun and the pulse of Joanne's passion. <laughs> With open hearts and raised voices, dance and cheer with us as we rediscover Joanne's story, concludes the synopsis. It's a life, queer and full of hope. In keeping this with reinterpretation of the historical figure, Joanne will be portrayed on stage by non-binary actor Isabel Thom. 
Ah, that looks like an appropriate cast for a story set in medieval Europe. Look at that. Oh, the historical accuracy. Mm. Attempting to head off the inevitable backlash to I. Joan's premise, the venue's artistic director, Michel Terry, released a statement adamantly declaring, We are not the first to present John in this way, and we will not be the last. And there we go. We are not the first one. This has been done before. This has always been the case. And if this has infected all the strata of culture and history, not only they are erasing and eradicating the fictitious histories of fictitious characters, such as when they are swapping a character in, for example, I don't know, a, a, a film or an adaptation, or in the American comic books, they always say, but they have always been this way. For example, one of the many, many examples, let us choose Iceman from the American X-Men comic books, who was just recently announced to be, uh, well, bisexual. Uh, well... And they were all, and they said, "Well, he was he was always like that." No, no, I have been reading X Men comic books my entire life, and I have never ever in my life thought about this because it's just not true. Well, let us move on. Regarding the use of pronouns, they refer to a singular person. It has been traced by the Oxford English Dictionary to as early as thirteen seventy five, years before Joan was ever born. She added. Uh, disingenuously and seemingly intentionally mis uh, misrepresenting the issue. Regardless, theatres do not deal with historical reality. Theatres produce plays, and in plays anything can be possible. And that is the problem. This is the excuse that they have about anything really today. Well, it's fantasy, so anything goes. All right. It's theatre, so anything goes. All right. It's an adaptation, so anything goes. All right. This is the deconstruction of everything. This is where it all starts, the chaos, the mayhem in, into which the world will inevitably turn. People, they just want to erase any rules, any values, any norms that have been established throughout decades and hundreds of years and millennia. And they have proved to be, well, working. All right, let us move on. Terry then argued, Shakespeare did not write historically accurate plays. He took figures of the past to ask questions about the world around him. Our writers of today are doing no different, whether that's looking at Anne Boleyn, Nell Gwynne, Emilia Bassano, Edward II or Joan of Arc. It was no accident that Shakespeare moved his, played, his playhouse beyond the jurisdiction of the London city walls, she continued. He wanted to play play with identity, power, with the idea of pleasure, and with all sides of an argument. Now, you can all, of course, argue uh, that uh, historical events and myths and legends have always been uh, interpreted and reinterpreted in various ways. Just look at uh, the evolution of the Arthurian legends. Now... The first mentions of uh, King Arthur were that uh, he was uh, uh, the king of the Britons um, who defended the British Isles from the raids of um, Angles and Saxons and Jutes and so on and so forth. And apparently he was a Celtic leader. Well, then, of course, when we get to Thomas Mallory in about the 15th century we get to the reinterpretation of King Arthur as a really um, late medieval character who already has nothing to do with, the, uh, with his Celtic heritage and is very much a Christian character. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, idea, the concept of the Holy Grail comes from Arthurian legends. It, it was born in Arthurian legends. You can't find any mention of the Holy Grail before that. But people have lost uh, any sort of sense for extremes. Because you can only interpret and reinterpret things that much and this far. You, can you have to always keep the core of the character. 
if you change the character to an extreme, you will deconstruct and destroy the character, and the character just loses everything that made the character or the historical personality uh, what it really uh, made the character. Shakespeare was not afraid <coughs> to ask difficult questions as he imagined the lives of 1,223 characters, the artistic director asserted. He represented an extraordinary range of diverse perspectives and identities and we are all still enjoying his work over 400 years later. Or, ah, uh, well, if you ask me, I mean, Shakespeare is a bit overrated. I mean, yes, yes, he's, he's yeah, he... He has written good things, good plays and sonnets, but uh, even at university I always thought he was uh, very much overrated. Shakespeare was not afraid of discomfort and neither is the globe. Concluding her statement, Terry affirmed, for centuries Joan has been a cultural icon portrayed in countless plays, books, films, etc. History has provided countless and wonderful examples of Joan portrayed as a woman. Yes, it, in each and every single text and adaptation and interpretation in a book, in a film, in anything. They have always, or they always stressed the fact that she was what the modern audience is so excited about. A strong, independent woman. But so suddenly you, you don't like it. It's not enough for you. Because women have finally, finally got what they wanted, and that is not equality, but superiority over men in culture. You see, everybody, or every single character in films and books and comics today, or only like 99%, is a strong woman female character. So you got what you wanted there, uh, but it's not enough. You, you can never be satisfied. So now you want more. You want something else. So from turning male characters into female characters, we then moved now from taking, well, basically any character and, and turning that character into what? Something. All right. The produc this production is simply offering the possibility of another point of view. That is the role of theatre, to simply ask the question, imagine if... Um, if you want some good what-if stories, go and read the 1960s Marvel comic books. Notably, not only does this gender swap of Juan impose contemporary gender politics uh, upon the historical figure, but it also erases the very thing that gives the story its inspirational weight, her female identity. Well, I tend to agree with bounding into comics very often. Born to French Roman Catholic peasants in 1412, amidst the period of warfare between her country and England, Joan's youth <coughs> saw her regularly presented with visions of various saints, including Saint Michael, Saint Margaret, and Saint Catherine. Hmm, we might have got to the core of the matter if the play is made by the English people, by British, and it is about a fr <laughs> French hero. That might be the reason. Is there still such a hatred between the, the, the British people and the French? That was, of course, a joke for those of you who can't take a joke these days. Eventually, these messengers related to Juan a summons from God, wherein he called upon her to ride to Charles the Seventh side and support him in keeping France out of English hands. Following a meeting with the future king of France, Joan was sent to aid the French relief army in the siege of Orléans, which by this point in her life had been raging for roughly five months. Upon her arrival at the front, her presence caused a swell of morale amongst her fellow countrymen, prompting the tide of battle to quickly turn in favour of the French. Joan will then proceed to ride with the French army through a number of further sorties, eventually coming to be regarded as somewhat an unofficial commander, a role that this time period would have otherwise been barred to her due to her gender. However, her time on the battlefield would come to an end in May 1430, when her unit was defeated during the siege of Compiègne. 
I'm sorry. It was. It has been a long time since I took my French lessons. <laughs> um, a loss which would result in her being taken prisoner by her Burgundian opponents and later sold by her captors to the English. Once in English hands, Joanne would be put on trial for heresy in a somewhat kangaroo court made up of those who considered her to be a perpetual thorn in the countryside, with her accusers pointing to her claims of visions from God and her penchant for wearing men's clothing in order to move undisturbed throughout the lands as two of the biggest pieces of evidence regarding her blasphemous ways. Inevitably found guilty, Joan was ultimately sentenced to death by the English and subsequently burned at the stake for her accused crimes. Unfortunately for the English, her execution did little to tarnish Joan's contributions as not only did the momentum she sparked eventually give way to a full French victory in the Hundred Years' War, but she was also crowned an official virgin saint of the Catholic Church in 1920. And if you want to go to the theater to see I, Joanne, it will around uh, from August the 25th to October the 22nd at the Globe. I think I have said all that I needed to say, my dear friends. Let me know in the comments down below what you think, and that will be all. Thank you very much for watching, and Maria.